So today, um, we're gonna talk about use cases. I'll show you two different ways of doing use cases. And the scenario that we're gonna use, we have two to use today. Um, let, if time permits, we'll go through both of them. But um, the primary one that I wanna use is Amazon because it's easy for everybody to understand. Use cases are another example or another method of gathering requirements. As we talked about, there's many different ways of gathering requirements, right? Um, interviews is, is one very effective method. You could do workflows, you could um, do jazz sessions, you could do many different ways of uh, gathering requirements. Use cases are another method of gathering requirements. It's an analysis tool to figure out your system configuration and to know how your, you know, what the flow of the system is. So any questions before I start talking about how to do use cases? Uh, is basically, it's another method to gather a requirement, right? Yes. Okay. It's one of the many ways that you can use to gather requirements. Okay. Would, and would you, have, you wouldn't just, I, I think with a use case, you probably know roughly what it is you, you've maybe mapped out something but already because you, you it's it, or, or or could you just start with a use case i'm not sure well so how do you get um requirements how do you know what to map out you know you talk to your business stakeholders you talk to them and you say okay what do you intend for the system to do mm. as a business analyst you really um every time i start a project it's like a big black box right mm. And as you understand the project more, you understand how the system should work. And based mm -hmm. on your understanding of the system is when you create either workflows or use cases or you know your requirements and you go back to your stakeholders and you get validation. Mm. Right. So you probably would have had some discussions first before you start right. use cases. Yeah. yeah, otherwise you won't know what to diagram, right? it would be very difficult for you to create use cases or workflows or anything for that matter before you had a chance to understand what the system should be doing. And there's actually two different methods of doing use cases. There's a model that you can create, which is like a pictorial view. And then there's like a written um, structure that we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to follow to create use cases. Both are accepted. So if you were to put in your requirements document, the BRD, your um, your pictorial view or like your tabular view, both would be accepted and pretty useful. So the reason why use cases are very useful is for your entire team, people, your developers, your QA people, your business stakeholders can take a look at you know your use cases and they can either validate and tell you yes you you understood this correctly and you documented it appropriately or no you're missing a few steps here so it's they're useful because they give you an outline of what the system functionality should be especially for our dev and our qa people they love use cases because on the back end when they're testing and they're they're coding and they're testing it it's very easy for them to identify and create use case uh, test uh, scripts um, and test cases because they can see what the flow should look like. So it becomes a very, very easy for them to, um, to look at the, the flow of the system, what it should be doing, and then create like, um, I don't know what uh, in the QA world you guys call it, but like exceptions, like what should not happen when you're testing a system. Does that make sense? So we talked about what use cases are, why they're most widely used, and that will go into the test case. So the scenario that I'm gonna use is Amazon. There's been a request to do um, electronic health record system, and if we have time, we'll get to that. But So the first tool, the pictorial view, if you guys um, at work, you guys, you guys are able to see my screen, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So when you're at work, um, typically Microsoft Visio is a tool that, you know, um, companies um, typically have for our BAs and our PMs, um, even Dev and QA. So if you're, you know, at work, you'll be using a tool called Microsoft Visio to create like a diagram for your use case. Um, for, you know, for us, you know, for practices, for just for practice purposes, you can use a website called um, draw.io. It's absolutely free for you guys to kind of just, um, you know, practice creating workflows and use cases. 
So I'm using draw.io. Uh, draw uh, this is the first time I'm using it. So uh, it's really, it seems really easy. So when we first think about creating our use case, the scenario that I want to use is Amazon. And what you typically do is you have actors. You have you can have primary actors and you can have secondary actors. So an actor is a is a could be a user that's going to be interacting with the system, or it could be like another subsystem. Perfect. So for our for our scenario, Amazon, can you guys think of what what the who the two primary actors are? Uh, who uses yeah, who uses um, Amazon customer? <laughs> who else uses the seller? Yes, sales representatives. Yeah, sellers. Okay. okay, perfect. So we have two users for Amazon. We have the customer and we have the seller. So what do people do on Amazon? The people buy the product from the Amazon. Mm -hmm. So before they buy what do they do they search for products right so your actors are your primary people that are going to be interacting with the system could be a, a human or could be systems and the, this all represents functionality that you could be doing in the system okay so typically when we write um these these are um you want to write in verbs because to showcase action that, pe that people are going to be doing their functionality, right? So searching for product is one thing. What else do people do on Amazon? They buy the product. They do research, right? Um, like, do you guys look at reviews before you buy anything on Amazon? Yes. Yes. Right. What else do you do? You buy products. What else do you do? I was, was going to say, add to basket, change. You might check. You pay for it. You add, you might change your selection. So let's maybe check out. Uh, check out or uh, check out meaning like um, add to cart. and then pay for products. Pay, pay. Okay, what else do you do? Uh, subscribe for certain services. Yes. Who subscribes to everything? The customer. <laughs> I love it. I love that feature. They're so super smart. Like they, I spend so much on Amazon. <laughs> Uh, uh, for making payments, you're using third party vendors, you know, system. So like maybe through a visa or like a bank is connected. To yeah. This. PayPal, banks. <clears throat> okay. Let's put that as pay for products and we can, um, we can detail that out a, in a little bit later, but let's leave that under pay for products. And I'll show you why I'm, I'm saying that. So what else, what else do you guys do on Amazon? Oh, um, trace your delivery. Yes. What else? So this is a good list. Let's start with this. Let's think about some things that our seller would do. Return product. Okay. Anything else our sellers would be doing, you guys? Listing. They interact through the uh, uh, backend team through uh, through the system. Yeah. Okay. So, looking at this list, what are you guys able to see? The reason why use cases are used is because before you begin um, working on a project, like I said, it's a big black box, and when you start thinking in this way to say, okay, what do people do on Amazon? Or what should my system be doing? You understand and you discover requirements that you may not have if you hadn't 
you know, thought of it in this way. And that's why this is an analytical tool. It's to help you discover requirements that you might not, or your customers um, or your stakeholders might not have thought about, right? Um, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yes. So what you wanna do now um, is identify, typically it should be just a, a line. Um, I don't know how to fix it on this tool. Okay, we're just gonna leave with what we have. So typically you draw a straight line for the things that these actors will be interacting with, okay? So as a customer, you're gonna be creating an account. As a customer, as a customer, you're gonna be searching for products. I have a question. So how would you input a system, uh, a system interaction with the system? So then your actor would be, um, your actor would be a different system. So in this case, we can say uh, a payment system interacting with the, uh, the system which customer uses. Yeah. So as I said in the beginning, your actor could be uh, a human. Uh, a person interacting with the system, or it could be an interface. And that's what your question is. What happens if we have an interface? Okay. So most of these things the customer's gonna do, let's just put some things for the seller as well. So the seller is also going to create an account. The seller is also going to research products for reviews. They could be doing that for their intel to figure out what other products they should be putting online, right? Um, our seller could also be tracking the shipments to see if it made it to the customer. Our seller could also uh, interact with people. And I think is gonna be returning products. So I think this is good enough for now. We could put all of these for the customer, but I wanted you guys to see which things the seller could also be doing. So when you create use case diagrams like this, it becomes very easy for our stakeholders to go down this high level list and figure out what else is missing. It becomes very easy for our dev and our QA folks to also understand the scope of the project and that's why use cases are primarily used. So research products and these become number three. So what you can do is now go back and create detail levels on what is needed to create that account to dive deeper to understand those those requirements? Does that make sense? Yeah, so basically it would consist maybe register login and also more granular details. Yes, yes, yes. So this becomes your level one of your use case, which is like the high level functionality or features for your system. And then each oval becomes another, like a detail level on what you need, to, what is considered or what is happening when you're creating that account? What is happening? So, uh, Sarabji, you're saying like those will be the flows or the scenarios? Mm -hmm. No, those, so what I'm saying is create account becomes its own primary um, use case. This is your high level. So when you're creating these, let's say you would name this as high level. And your next one would be so in the create account, your actors again are going to be so now when you're creating an account, what, what happens? What should happen? Um, basic 
So I'll sign up details here. Yeah, that yeah. will be provided first. Yeah. And then um, select account type. Select account type. Right? Are they going to be a buyer? So you see how we're going down and we're thinking through, we're analyzing what needs to happen for an account. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So again, we just talked about the high level and then we go down and we create detail level again. So that way, when you're writing your requirements and you have these flows, it's super easy for everybody that's involved in the project to understand what functionality needs to be um, coded, tested, and delivered. Make sense? Awesome. Okay. So the other method that we do use cases is in something like this. So what this is called um, is still use cases. Again, as I mentioned, they're both primarily used um, in the industry. So um, lots of people um, will use um, diagrams. It all kind of depends on how you learn the best. It's, again, it's a method for you to gather the best um, uh, complete requirements. So whatever works for you, um, use that. For me, I like to do a lot of workflows and use cases because it helps me see everything um, from start to, to finish and helps me with the validation piece. This is another way that you would do use cases. So let's say, um, and this is just kind of writing things out and then thinking about the flow. So you start, there's lots of templates out, out there, you guys. So what I did is I, I Googled the template and I updated this because of, to make it work for me. Um, so let's start with this. So description is um, creating Amazon. So that's our description of our use case. The author I would put me. So fair warning you guys, I hear my baby and he's up. So um, he may come in <laughs> shortly. Okay, so the, tr the trigger is, so tr when we talk about use cases in this scenario, a trigger is something that needs to happen for the use case to begin. So if we're talking about creating a platform for people to buy and sell the trigger product, um, there was a need. But let's say, um, let's use this, actually let's do the create account scenario. So the trigger in this um, event would be somebody wanting to use Amazon to either buy or sell. So that Maybe. would be our uh, then maybe the trigger would be, you know, entering the URL because that would be the first step to go and yes. create an account. So let's change this um, to creating. Okay. The trigger would be um, um, a need or desire to use Amazon. You guys hear my baby? Um, or... or seeing a product on Amazon. It doesn't matter. So trigger is something that um, leads you to our primary actor is going to be from this standpoint for this case, use case, Let's say uh, customer. Secondary actors. Um, don't think we have any at this point. So the preconditions. Um, somebody needs to have access to the internet. Um, either have um, Amazon app know how to use the internet? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Email ID? Yes. 
user can enter with the email id or mobile number address details i have an email id for um, address details address details Having a bank account or PayPal account. That's good. You also can have cash on delivery. I'm sorry, what? You also have cash on delivery. You don't have that here. Ah, uh, we have it. Well, that's not a precondition. Precondition is something that needs to happen before they can create an account. So, so in that sense, do we need a valid payment method option here? Because so yes, so a valid payment method would be creating an account. That's not required, right? Um, if we are talking about yes. to create an account, so if you're creating an account in Amazon, a payment method. I'm not sure. You may be right. You don't need. Um, method I don't think it you have to do that until you check out so you're probably right okay so let's talk about post conditions post conditions are things that happen after somebody does what we're talking about so in this scenario what is what would happen once the customer is has created an account receive confirmation of the account number okay don't you think like, you know, someone who was uh, trying to go to Amazon, prior to that, they should have a bank account in terms for them to do a payment via online? So I don't Just think... Just like someone uh, needs the internet before they could able to access to Amazon. Right. But I don't think that Amazon requires you to have a valid payment method before you can just create an account with them. I think that's required when you uh, purchase a product. Okay, right. Yeah, so that's why we removed it. Okay. Yeah. So like, let's say if our use case was purchase product or something, then that would okay, be, right. mm -hmm. be part of our preconditions. And correct me, there is another point, like uh, if we don't have any valid payment method, we can go via cash and delivery and we can make a payment. Yeah, that's, but, this is the first time I'm hearing about that. That's not available everywhere. Okay, so let's finish this out. Um, so the normal flow would be you go to amazon.com, you click on sign up button, you add you um, add or create username, you create a password, provide email address. What else? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, right there where you're typing right now, is that, could you use that for end user acceptance testing? Yes, that's why use cases are so, um, uh, I'm trying to do too many things. That's why use cases um, are highly favored um, and are used um, because what when you send this to your dev teams and your QA teams, along with your customers, right? Your customers know their business processes and by going through the normal flow, they can identify what's missing. So that's a big plus that you're not missing requirements. The second and the third is that your dev and the QA team, when they see this flow, they know exactly what to code and what they can use for our, you know, their test cases um, and utilize during test for testing purposes. So that's absolutely right. Okay, so this is the flow for creating an account, your name, email address, password, re-enter password, and then create my Amazon account. So though, these are the things that we would list in our normal flow. Does that make sense? And yes. I have a question uh, here, so uh, These are all the steps back, actually we are doing after collecting the requirements, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so here we are actually gathering the requirement or we are analyzing the requirement because that is making it easy. You're doing both. So when you're collecting the requirements, you need to put it in a flow to make sure that it makes sense and also to make sure that if um, instead of uh, they could get to Amazon by searching for a product, I don't know. Um, they could be um, go to Amazon.com and then maybe uh, be doing product 
um, they want to buy a product and then they're prompted into creating an account. Do you guys understand how I did that? So there could be, they could just already be on Amazon, want to purchase something, and then they're prompted to create an account. So what we're trying to identify is if there's another way for our customers or our stakeholders or you know users to get to the scenario that we're, um, the use case that we're working on, which is creating an account. Um, the exceptions are things that um, could um, be like, um, you know, let's say if the user already has an Amazon account. So these are things that are um, a different approach or a different method. So let's say if you already have an account and you try to create an account, um, the user, so the exception is the user already has an Amazon account. Um, Over password. Yeah, yeah. In that scenario, they would click on forget password and then go back into the app, to their own account. Uh, sir, did I have a question? Right? Yeah. Uh, so this particular use case which you are elaborating would be one of the requirements. Yes. And how would I relate to user stories? Like, I'm like a bit confused in that sense. Okay, user stories are used for agile project management. Agile, yeah, exactly. So they're they're a little bit different, but again, user stories are a method of um, documenting requirements. It's just a different uh, of documenting requirements. Okay. So, so they are different, they are not used together. No, no. Okay. So like, for example, if um, we're writing a user story on creating an account, I would say as a customer, I want In them order to, to, yes, so that I can go purchase products. So again, it's a different method of gathering requirements, password. So then what this allows you to do is um, create, a, you know, a requirements around what, how to help this user so that they can get back into the account. Um, the business rules are things that um, um, all users can only have one account. Yes. Okay. He's not listening. That's my kid for you. <laughs> so. Um, a business rule could be all users can have only one account. So really this, the template that you're using right now, it's really for the more detail requirements, right? Like going yeah. more into depth, but um, as a high level, you would, would you recommend the other? Well, you always um, start with a high level and then you would always go into the detail because um, when you're submitting your requirements, you need to provide the, that level of detail. Does that make sense? No, yeah, it totally does. I was just trying to figure out like if I was submitting my high level and my detailed you know, requirements, how I would submit both of them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was just kind of thinking, I know that we have to do both, right? We have to have the high level requirements because that's how we get to the more detailed requirements. Yeah. But if you were submitting that, um, how would you submit that formally? In your BRD. Okay, and the BRD, and right. so. So typically what you do is you start with the high level, right? To get um, in correct, understanding correct. of everything. And then, then you go into the detail. Once you require, add them in, uh, depends on what your company wants or what templates they use, right? Uh, depending on what templates they use, let's say if they use a requirements management tool, then you would go back once your requirements are drafted and validated. Put the requirements in the val, you know, in your in your tool. It, lots of companies use uh, like a Word BRD template. Then you would put your requirements in that template. Lots of companies use Excel. So then you would put your requirements in the Excel document. Um, but it will have both the high level and then the detailed requirements. Typically, yeah, like your high level uh, could be in diagrams, um, but if you have your details, then um, you could you can put both, but typically it's the detail level that you need. And the diagram which you showed, like, uh, is it in the BRD only? Yeah. In the you, use case or like? Uh, you can, yeah, you can attach these in your BRD document um, as attachments, so or references when you're, um, you know, ref you, when you're documenting your requirements, you can put these as references or attachments.
Would you be able to share the document that you created? This one? These? Yeah, I'll put them in. Yeah, the, yeah for sure. Thank you. So if we are making any application based on agile methodology or waterfall methodology or whatever that is spiral. So I believe that this doc this document is required uh, for every everywhere, every methodology which we are using. If we are making any application or if we are running anything uh, based on any uh, methodology like agile or waterfall, so I believe that this business case will be required for everywhere. Um, as I said, this is one of the ways that you use to gather requirements. Um, it's not required um, across the board unless you know your company wants it, then it's required. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, you know there's many different methods to gather requirements. Interviews, jazz sessions, workflows, use cases. This is one of the many. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, I joined late, but I have a question. Like the diagram which you were making, like is it the use case diagram or like what we call that? Use, use case. Use case. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Is Jira uh, sometimes used for this? Have it, you ever heard of that, Jira? Jira, yeah. Jira is used to track bugs. Uh, lots of people use it to track requirements as well. So it's a yeah, we use it internally for defect management and also documenting the requirements like we follow the agile method. So every user story which we have is documented. In uh, I think for projects it's used to... Um, it's also, it's, yeah. Jira it is used to put this user stories and tasks. Yeah, so Jira, lots of people are using Jira for lots of things. Um, when it first came into the market, it was used for defect management. Um, you can track requirements, you can track user stories on it as well. Yes, that's correct. Thank you guys so much. My IT team uses this a lot and I think they're trying to get us to use it. So I was just wondering if it could be leveraged to, you know, for this. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? <laughs> I'll talk to you guys Bye. later. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.